Welcome back to Wojo's Greenhouse and Garden Center here in Ortonville. I'm George and we're ready to do another program of the Green Team. A lot of what we're talking about may seem repetitious, but each week here in the Garden Center we have similar issues that keep coming up. So we'll keep including them and as we go through the, the program, through the series, I think folks will have a pretty good understanding of what it takes to be successful with your garden. The first is watering. Watering is an ongoing issue. We happen to be taping today when it is hot and humid and we're in the shade because that's where it's more comfortable. A lot of our plants aren't able to be in the shade. As we see the plants behind me here, we have to water those sometimes two and three times a day. In their containers, they dry out very, very quickly. In your landscape, your plants may dry out very quickly. What we've talked about is learning your soil. If your soil is well drained, if when you dig a hole, pour a bucket of water in, if it perks through very quickly, you can't overwater your plants. But some people have more clay. They have a denser soil. And if you were to do that water test, you'd find that the water slowly perks out you run the risk of possibly overwatering. So there's a delicate balance. You must learn your soil, learn your own environment. Because people will ask me, how often should I water? I can't tell them that. They've got to know for their own conditions. They've got to analyze their situation and then make the, make the correct uh, adjustment. With that, we can do either too much or not enough. If it's in a wet situation uh, where the, the water is real heavy, you can overwater. And we're getting some plants back now that look as though they've been drowned. We have the other situation, plants back dry as a bone. They haven't been watered enough. So with that, watering is critical. And if you have newly planted trees, we've talked about this before, this is the tree watering bag, sometimes referred to as a gator bag. It allows you to hold up to 20 gallons of water around the base of the tree and that slowly perks into the ground. It takes anywhere from five to eight hours to have that 20 gallons of water seep into the soil. Using this two to three, three to four times a week is an excellent way to get that water to a newly planted plant. Fertilizing is also something that we do here on an ongoing basis. I had a friend in this week that said my hanging baskets aren't looking so hot. And I said, well, how often have you been fertilizing? She said, well, maybe once a month. And here in the store on our tag, we recommend fertilizing weekly, every seven to 10 days. So if you want nice looking annuals, you want to fertilize and water on a regular basis. Speaking of fertilizing, out here in the tree and shrub area, we're rapidly approaching August 1st. August 1st is that date when we don't fertilize after that point. We don't want any fresh new growth coming on the plant and running the risk of having that new tender growth frozen with a frost. So generally, we use August 1st as that cutoff point and we don't fertilize beyond that point. Getting back to watering, I want to mention a situation that happened this week. Rachel went back to the mulch pile, the, our dead plant place where, where dead plants go, and she found a beautiful tropical hibiscus that had been returned up in the greenhouse and it was taken back, but it had a lot of life, a lot of vitality. There were still leaves on it, there were still flowers on it. And I said, Rachel, do you want it or can I take it home? I took it home, I soaked it overnight, and new growth sprung from those stems. It wants to live. So many times we can resurrect those plants, look pretty poor, pretty ugly, in a short matter of time, they're back and looking very, very nice. So stay with a plant. They're just like us. They want to recuperate and recover and they will be, they will be fine. We've talked about deer. Deer in a number of different ways and we have various products that will help keep the deer away. We've got Repelzol. We've got the liquid fence as products that the uh, deer 
When these are applied to plants, the deer will stay away. But more importantly, coming up around August 1st is the date when bucks start rubbing their antlers. And it's very important that you have the trunks of your trees protected with a trunk guard. We have these here for smaller trees. If you have larger trees, you may want to go to a hardware store and get larger corrugated uh, plastic that you can put around the, around the trunk of your tree to save it. A few years back, we had a tree project here for Ortonville and the sewer line that came through and about 140 trees were given away. And about four weeks into the program, a lady called all upset that we didn't remind her to protect the tree from deer. The deer, over, in just a matter of minutes, had decimated that, that brand new tree. So we're cautioning people, we're reminding people that the deer, when they do rub their antlers, can cause a lot of damage in a hurry. Japanese beetles are also around. I found them in my yard for the first time last night and, and sprayed. Ideally, I should have used the bare systemic. I do, sometimes don't practice what I preach and I need to next year. It'll make things a lot easier for me if I use the bare systemic on the plants that are susceptible to insects eating them. I had a situation, I guess it relates to my braided uh, hibiscus tree. A call came in this week from a man that said, I bought a couple weeks ago, I bought two hydrangeas. One looks real good and the other one looks very, very bad. And because it had been just a short period of time since the, the plants had been planted, I encouraged him to dig up the plant that was looking so poor and to submerse the plant in water, to totally submerse it, let the air bubbles come out of the root mass, let those roots get saturated, work with the roots to loosen them up and replant that plant. That plant in its current state in his landscape wasn't gonna survive or wasn't gonna look very well. So just two weeks into the process, I encouraged him to please dig it up, work with the plant, get it hydrated again, work with the roots, loosen them up, and then with that, replant it and take care of it. So hopefully he'll have some good results with that. Related to hydrangeas, hydrangea happens to be one of our most popular categories and as, as we talked about last week, the various kinds of hydrangea, we have within the paniculata or the PG variety, the larger cone-shaped flowered hydrangeas, plants that start off white and then turn pink our signage shows a pink flower and I've had a lady that was ready to return her plant because it wasn't pink and I said you've got to give it time it starts off white and turns to pink but this particular lady didn't want to hear that she wanted a a pink plant right away but I I I think I finally got through to please give it some time so that is uh, something that we look at we've talked about the bloom booster to help enhance blooming I would encourage you to consider that and uh, something that Nancy Zerlag had this past week in the, uh, in the Detroit News talking about rose sawfly larva. They're active now and I would encourage you to keep an eye out for those because it can uh, cause problems. We're going to take a break and come back soon.
Welcome back to our next segment of the green team and the next area we're going to talk about is soil testing. It's never too late in the year to do a soil test. We have people in wondering about how they change the color of their hydrangeas from pink to blue and or vice versa and I ask have you had a soil test lately and the answer is normally no. And so we encourage people to do that soil test and then you take the guesswork out of it. That's the theme of a handout from Michigan State. It says don't guess soil test and by doing this soil test you end up getting a report back from Michigan State that is very, very extensive. This is one that came in from a guest and I'm covering his name and phone number so you won't see it. But with that, it is a three page handout that is very, very extensive in the information to share with you about your soil and what it takes for your particular growing situation, whether you're a vegetable gardener, perennials, annuals, or the trees and shrubs. So it's excellent information and a wise thing to do. Don't guess soil test. And these are available through Michigan State University. You can do a Google search and order online. They send you a kit that you simply take soil samples around your yard and then with that you send that into Michigan State and they send you the, the nice report back. So with that we encourage you to do that soil testing. The next thing that has happened uh, that is starting to happen is something called maple tar spot. I've had several folks in saying what are these black spots on my maple leaves? And I tell them that it's, it's more cosmetic. It doesn't really harm the maple leaf. It doesn't kill the maple tree. It's cosmetic like a pimple. And with that, if you were really intent on keeping this off your leaves, you could spray with a fungicide periodically throughout the growing season. But there are certain groupings of maples that are subject to having this fungus appear on the leaves and it does turn black and a little bit unsightly but it's, it's something called tar spot nothing to be alarmed about it doesn't harm the tree but again if you wanted to take care of it you could if you wanted to. This week I had a guest come in with some apple so they had a, a apple tree they showed me some apples and some leaves that had apple scab on them. This is something that affects both fruiting apple trees and the crab apple trees that we sell here. It's called apple scab. It's a fungal disease that impacts the leaves and also the fruit. One of the things that when I talked to this guest about it, I said, did you spray? If that's one of the things we encourage people when you buy a fruit tree here you want to learn how to prune it, how to spray it, and how to keep the deer and rabbits away from it. It's not just a matter of plopping a tree in the ground and four or five years later having nice nice fruit. You need to work at it. It's a labor of love to have good fruit. So with that part of it is the spray process. Using the orchard spray at periodic times throughout the spring can prevent apple scab from attacking your fruiting apple trees. It also works on your flowering crab apple trees also. And also we have for the homeowner, we have the funginol that will also work. One of the things though that we find is that for the apple scab, a big issue has, has to do with the varieties that are more resistant and what we try and sell here at Wojo's are examples or varieties of the crab apple trees that are more resistant to the apple scab. So with that our customers hopefully won't have that that problem. Another thing I wanted to mention relating to fruit trees we talked last week about phenology and the growing degree days. Every week there's a gentleman, Bob Tritton, who is the extension agent for southeastern Michigan. 
he does a report for fruit crop farmers around the area that grow different fruits telling them what they can look out for uh, for their various fruits. It gives a report on how much rain we've had, the growing degree days, and what kind of insects they're dealing with and other disease issues. So again, if you're going to raise fruit, if you're going to have fruit trees or other, other brambles, you want to learn more about it so you can be successful. And this report for Michigan State does come out on a weekly basis and provides good information for you. We've talked about the bird watcher group that meets the fourth Wednesday of every month in Clarkston at the Gateway, so that if you're interested in a group that uh, enjoys watching birds, that activity is on a monthly basis. A local veterinary in the area posted something about apple seeds being toxic to dogs. And I did a Google search and found it isn't just apple seeds that are toxic, but with that, apples and crab apple seeds are toxic to dogs, cats, and other mammals, including humans. So you've got to be careful in, in how you, if you chew these, to release the particular chemical. Black walnuts also the nuts of the black walnuts can make animals sick. And we found also that cherries and the relatives of the cherries, the apricots, peaches, and plums, can also produce a chemical that metabolizes into cyanide, which is not good. And finally, holly plants. So something you want to be careful with as you if you do have pets be aware of the kinds of plants that you have that can cause issues for your animals i had a guest in several years ago that sadly told a story of how they were pruning ewes around their uh, home and they thought lush green foliage it would be good for the for their horses and it turns out the you is toxic to horses and a half hour later her horses were laying dead in the in the uh, stable and it turned out to be the the you plant that caused them to die so just some information that we need to keep in mind as we as we have pets this week i had a guest asking about the bear systemic and i did some research for her over the phone. She had lost the instruction part of this, so I, I was able to go in and tell her how much to apply, but it's always, when folks ask us how much to apply, we all, always encourage you to read the instructions. We don't want you saying, you told me so, we don't do that. So uh, the Bear Systemic is an excellent pro product to use. Some fun coming up next month. About a month away, we have the eclipse of the sun, and we'll be talking more about this. Yesterday on Facebook, we did something interesting. For the second time this year, one of our employees has a drone and took some beautiful pictures of aerial shots of our nursery here. So if you go on Facebook and look under Wojo's Greenhouse, you'll be able to see how beautiful those aerial shots are. And uh, the last thing I want to talk about is extending your growing season. This was an article that came out of Michigan State. The beautiful large allium that have the round balls painted with blue paint will last longer in your, in your garden. So we'll take a break and come back for the final segment. Welcome back for the final segment of the Green Team. And we're going to talk about 
something that is very important in the state of Michigan as well as the other states in the Union. Every month I get a email from an organization called Don't Move Firewood. This was established probably, I'm guessing, a good 15, 16 years ago when the emerald ash borer came about and we recognized how important it was that we don't move firewood. The emerald ash borer came to us in shipping pallets from I believe the the area uh, of China and because of the emerald ash borer being native to China, it doesn't have the same impact on the trees, but over here in the United States, it has been a devastating insect on ash trees. So the whole notion of wherever you buy your firewood, that's where you're to burn it. Don't move firewood. Also related to this, and we'll be talking about it more next week, or next month I should say, August is what's described as tree check month and it's important that you check your trees to see if there's any telltale signs of insect activity. In an earlier segment we talked about the emerald ash borer and that's the insect that has the large antennae and what's devastating about this and while I mention it while the emerald ash borer takes care of the ash. The Asian longhorn beetle takes care of birches, elms, golden rain tree, honey locust, katsura, maples, mountain ash, London plain tree, poplars, and willows are all impacted by this Asian longhorn beetle. So that's why it's so important that we be on the lookout for this. Hopefully it'll never come to Michigan. Right now it's in four areas across the United States and those areas are quarantined and they're controlling it. But hopefully this won't be uh, a concern for us in Michigan actually having it here. But we'll talk more next month about don't moving the firewood. Also related to that is a report that I saw when, I, when this website came about Every year, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources does a health analysis. And this is a 52-page report, and I'm not going to go page by page, but it, it is a very comprehensive analysis of the kinds of pests or organisms that are affecting our forest population here in Michigan. The industry that the, the trees provide is major to the, to the economy of the state and it's important that we stay abreast of this. So that's why we'll be talking more about taking a look at your trees, talking about tree health and the importance of not moving firewood. We're going to then next move around the greenhouse. I mentioned our Facebook page in a previous segment our Facebook page had some pictures that related to Color Your World at Wojo's. There were some drone shots overhead here at Wojo's that showed the dynamic color that we have in the tree and shrub area. It's not just here in tree and shrub, but it's also in perennials and annuals. And then the last thing we're going to talk about is a bit of a uh, excitement for us here at Wojo's and we'll share that in the final minutes but right now we're going to wind down here and move into perennials so that we can take some pictures and show some of the dynamic color there as you color your landscape color your world here at Wojo's we're now in the perennial area and we're going to be taking a look at various displays but the first display we're looking at is one that has the beautiful pink of the garden flocks and then we have the purple or lavender of the salvia and lastly in the center we have the ornamental grass described as sea oats. 
We put together these displays to give our guests an idea of how these plants can function together and how beautiful they are within your garden. We're now in the perennial department where our perennial staff have put together an array of plants that would be dynamic in your own garden. We're starting with the beautiful daylily going bananas. Beside that is the butterfly weed that the monarch butterflies really, really go after. We've got an old time favorite, the black eyed Susan. Behind that, another variety of garden flocks. Down here, Gallardia, bordered by some short ornamental grasses. And again, as we pan the whole table, the color is just dynamic. Coloring your world here at Wojo's. Another display that our perennial staff has put together deals with a group of plants, one being the nice open airy Gara. This one happens to have a beautiful pink flower and it just waves freely in the, in the breeze. Right beside that is the Helioptus Tuscan Sky. Beautiful yellow color. Next to it, the purple coneflower. This is a smaller version called Pow Wow Wild Berry, staying smaller in its size. And then having the main place on the table are the very, very fragrant daylilies. And these are or ornamental lilies, I should say, not daylilies. They don't rebloom, they, they bloom once, but when they do, they are very, very fragrant and very enjoyable in your landscape. In perennials, a plant that really, really is in demand are the butterfly bushes. Folks love to have plants that attract butterflies and other pollinators. And we here have a selection of about eight or nine different varieties. The first one we have here is the Dark Dynasty with a bright, bright purple flower and ad adjacent to that is Inspired Pink. As we move down the table, we have some lower varieties. Lo and behold, Blue Chip, which is a smaller variety. We have a reddish pink variety called Miss Molly and that one is one that is striking in the landscape. And lastly, we have a variegated leaf and a lavender flower called Summer Skies. So that's just a sampling of some of the butterfly bushes we have. The last area that we're in now is back in our greenhouse. A shipment came this week and it is what we refer to at Wojo's Christmas in July. While the Hallmark Channel has Christmas in July and shows Christmas movies, here we have our first shipment of poinsettia cuttings. And I'm holding a tray of a variety of bright red and in a matter of 120 days, these plants will be ready for retail. It's a little bit scary to think that 120 days from now, we're in mid-November and in our retail Christmas season here at Wojo's and our growers will do a tremendous job, like they say, in the next 120 days to bring these plants ready for a very special Christmas season. So we're excited about Christmas here in July. Julie and Donna will be planting these in the next day or two, getting ready for the holidays. See you next time. Stay cool.